Hey boss, hey boss, you gotta wake up. Oh, uh, fuck off, I'm trying to sleep. No, oh, boss, check it out. Because of Earth Day, everybody loses their fucking minds. They get so hopped up on the guilt associated with climate change that they have to make a bunch of stupid videos where they use misleading science. Oh, uh, actually, I already made that video, so yeah, I'm good. Mmm, that bunny was tasty. No, no, boss, you don't realize this is another whole video, but it's a skeptic this time. An armored skeptic. Isn't that that guy who debunks flat earthers and things like that? Yeah, I like that guy. Yeah, but this Canadian YouTuber just did a response video to Steven Crowder. It's so hypocritical that you can make him look like a fool in seconds. I don't know, Steven Crowder's a big boy, he can do his own response to the response video. I don't see why I should get involved. Wait a second. Did you say he was Canadian? Carlson ready. Doesn't shoot it here. The pass to the side of the net score! Fuck it, I'll do it. Fire up the intro. By popular request, this is a list of the top five myths associated with global warming, I mean climate change. My purpose here is not at all to pretend to be a scientist, but to get you, the viewer, to think about real science versus media hype. First off, here's the definition of science. Now, if you find yourself at all skeptical, a climate science denier is what you're labeled. After planning this video for months and reading the data and getting all my clips ready, it's only now that I finally realize just how petty this whole thing is. Crowder is just complaining here that if you do not concede to the current scientific consensus on climate change, then some people will label you a climate change denier. The 97% scientific consensus that global warming was caused by man and will be catastrophic was debunked in a review showing only 1-3% to of respondents explicitly stated agreement with the IPCC declarations on global warming. Whew, that was a lot to say in a little time. However, it's pretty obvious that this scientific consensus that you're going to tote around is complete bullshit. It has been complete bullshit and known to be complete bullshit for a long time here. The 97% scientific consensus uses what's called a social proof. Essentially all they did was they reviewed a bunch of papers and they looked for the words global climate change. Now if you had those words in your paper that meant you were a part of this 97 percent. If you actually look into it and actually <laughs> look and see how many people actually believe in the IPCC findings it's around 1 percent. That's how wrong this claim is. And I said in my last video, and I'll say it once again, and one of the reasons why I made this video as a response is simply because you keep peddling the wage gap and you don't even realize it. Oh, but don't worry, it gets worse. People are going to use mean words. Besides, it's an accurate label. You do deny that the current climate change paradigm is true. It keeps changing, you retard. And the only ones who are actually denying science are people on the left. Now that Crowder's entire political message has been swept to the side, and he can't push his liberals are intolerant to people with different opinions narrative, let's just skip all the political crap and get to the meat of his skepticism. In Steven Crowder's video, it's pretty obvious that he's trying to go after the politics side of the climate change debate. And you're just going to throw that all to the side and get to the skepticism. Well, okay, then I'll use skepticism against you. Let me explain a little more. To be a science denier at all to the current climate change coalition, you merely need to be skeptical of any one of these four things. Okay, maybe you're right, I'm being a bit harsh here. Being skeptical of certain things does not make you a denier of those things. You're right. So, uh, what's the first one? Number one, that the Earth is warming. <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, uh, Steve? One thing we know for sure about our changing climate is that the net temperature of our little blue marble is raising. And that this net temperature rise correlates with the rise in carbon dioxide. Yes, there are isolated areas where there's cooling or ice growth, but the planet is huge and has several climates. I agree with Armored Skeptic here. However, later in this video, he's going to show actual data to us that disproves what he's saying. And also that he believes 100% that the Earth is warming. In the future, which has some serious flaws to that analysis. Two, that humans 
are the primary cause of it. Where are you getting this from? I've heard this before, but it's simply not true. The climate always changes and will forever change. Humans can no more cause a change in the environment than Crowder can cause a person to laugh. It used to be that human activity was going to cause an ice age. Then it became human activity avoided an ice age by causing global warming. Then it happened to be there's a climate that goes through a natural cycle and human activity is exacerbating that cycle. The consensus keeps fucking changing. And the thing is, if you took this statement from Armored Skeptic and you went back, say, I don't know, three years, then Armored Skeptic would be labeled a scientific denier. It just doesn't make sense. The debate is about how much humans contribute to the change and how much damage we've caused. Number three, that it will have catastrophic results. <laughs> well, that's pretty subjective. If by catastrophic you mean that the oceans will become so saturated with carbon dioxide that sea life will begin to die from the acidity and become so warm that the ice shelves melt, raising sea levels, paired up with coral reefs dying from the same conditions, making coastal towns a thing of the past along with ever-growing deserts and abnormal droughts destroying farmland causing mass starvation and increased hurricanes and floods, then yes, I believe that could be pretty catastrophic. I have no idea where Armored Skeptic actually got this information about all these catastrophic changes and how it's settled science that we've actually going to see all of these things happen should the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere continue the way that it is. So I'm left to believe the only place that he got it was Al fucking Gore. But he's right, we don't know for sure that this will happen, just like we don't know for sure that if I pull this trigger, it will relieve me of this nonsense. Huh. What do you know? You should probably load the gun first, that way you'd know. Now I realize this is just a joke, however, Armored Skeptic is trying to essentially say there's two possibilities. One is that mankind's contribution to the climate cycle has no effect, and the other side is that mankind actually does a lot to change the climate which causes a catastrophic result. Now we have two possibilities of what we could do about that. We could either ignore it or we could do something about it. And while it's not explicitly expressed to be that it would make more sense to do something about it than it would be to ignore it simply based on the actual catastrophe, in opposition to Steven Crowder, that's essentially what Armored Skeptic here is implying. You see, there was this guy. He was named Pascal, and I think he invented the triangle or something. And he came up with the idea known as Pascal's Wager, where he said there's either not a god or there is a god and we can choose to ignore him, or we can choose to worship him. And he did a cost-benefit analysis based on this. Now, based on what Armored Skeptic is saying here, he essentially would want to worship God simply for the catastrophic results if he shouldn't. And here I thought he was an atheist. And most importantly, number four, that the only entity competent and fit to stop these results is the United States government or some international form of government. Right, you're totally right. The only way to fix this is if everyone in the world all agrees to banish the use of certain pollutants and control the use of others. Oh no, a government's the only way to force that to I agree, the only way to guarantee that everyone follows this regimen is to impose an authoritative legislation. And such an authoritative legislation could be used to steal other liberties from us in the future. And I understand why that's a hill that so many people have chosen to die on. I'm even disappointed in Bill Nye's participation in pushing a carbon tax bill and treating it as if it will actually make some kind of difference. But if that's the real reason, you just want to keep your freedoms, then that's fine, just be honest about that. Anyways, that's an apology. Takes for me. To give skeptics some credit, at least he understands the scam that is carbon taxes and how that really would do absolutely nothing to change the current amount of CO2 that's going into the atmosphere. It's not could be used, it's would be used to take away your freedoms. Every single time government tries to solve one of these emotional politicized problems that really is up in the air, what they end up doing is to serve their own needs with more taxes, more power, more regulations and more money flooding into either wind energy or solar energy, which happens to benefit the politicians themselves. I present to you the top five global warming, I mean climate change myths that you most likely believe. Consensus. 97% of scientists 
agree on climate change. Before we get to the fact that this is patently untrue, it's important to note that science isn't determined by consensus, it's determined by truth. There might have been consensus that the Earth was flat among certain circles. Truth revealed that it wasn't. I'm not even saying that most climate scientists, particularly those in a public dole, wouldn't say that climate change is an imminent threat and humans are the cause of it. My point is that just because someone says there is consensus, it doesn't absolve you or them of critical thinking. I don't know where this 97% consensus comes from because Crowder doesn't cite it. You didn't cite anything in your video, so there's this thing called a search engine, and you can use that to find a whole wealth of information that happens to be out there. But he's right, science isn't determined by consensus, it is determined by objective data. And yes, it would be bad form in a debate format to use an ad populum fallacy. But, I mean, just, just look at this carbon dioxide trend, and look at this temperature trend, look at the ice melt trend, look at the sea level trend. I couldn't argue that these figures are a good thing if I tried. And this is where you royally fuck up. Remember earlier in the video how you said that the Earth was warming? Two out of four of these graphs show the exact opposite. At least you did some research, but did you honestly even look at the graphs? Well, don't worry, I'll do it for you. Because I searched for each one of these, found them, at least the closest approximation I possibly could. And I'm going to look at them with a little bit more skepticism. Number one, the CO2 in the atmosphere in parts per million. Now, I don't have a problem with this particular graph, but I did cover it a lot in my last video, so I'm going to skip over it. The short of it is, at 400 parts per million, that's essentially the top end of the typical climate cycle that is experienced throughout history, at least in terms of the ice core data. There's some problems with the actual data collection. I haven't actually gone into the CO2 collection data on this particular graph to see if it's accurate. But I have no reason to believe that it isn't, so I'm just going to skip over it. Number two, January to December, global mean temperature over land and ocean. Now, if you look at this graph and you zoom in on all the data past 2000, what do you notice about the trend? Hmm, it appears to be going down a little bit. Armored Skeptic claimed that the trend was only going higher. And he ignored the data. He, I don't even think he looked at the graph. I think he just collected the graph and threw it up on the screen to alarm people. But he didn't go into this at all. He didn't actually even look at the graph at the very top end there and see that the temperature line is receding. Number three, global sea ice area. Now, the trend that you're talking about of loss of sea ice that you're concerned about has been going on for a year and a half. Now, you could also consider that this is surface area, not volume. It's only been going on for a year and a half, so there's not enough data to consider in this particular regard. You could consider the change between north and south ice, where the ice is essentially melting in the Arctic and moving down to the Antarctic, and the, the consideration of how much ice is actually on land versus in the water, and so many other factors, so you know what, I'm just going to give you this one. Number four, the CU five-year sea level, 2005 to 2010. Now, if you draw a red trend line through the middle to an arbor arbitrary set of data, then you can get it to do almost anything. And I showed this in one of my previous videos on the minimum wage, where one of the particular sets of data had the actual trend line going down in terms of job losses, where it increased jobs rather than reduced them. But if you looked at many different sets of data and many different trend lines, you notice that most of the trend lines were actually leading towards job losses. This is a selection bias right here. If I were to draw a trend line from 2009 to 2010, I could draw a line that is significantly sloped downwards. So once again, I don't think you actually even looked at this graph. I think you saw the trend line, saw that it was up a little bit, and said, good enough for me, and threw it on the screen. Plus, what are we looking at here? We're looking at 10 millimeters. That's right, 10 millimeter difference over the span of five years. Now, could that compound over and over and over and over and over again? If this trend line is accurate, that means over the next 100 years, we're looking at 20 centimeters of the increase of the sea level. That, that doesn't sound like something I should be too concerned about. Myth number two, you've heard this one everywhere. The ice sheets are melting. Truth, 
The Antarctic ice sheets are actually growing by billions of tons per year. Does that come to me from climate change denial slash flat earthers.com? No, how about NASA? <laughs> I think you're gonna regret going with the smug face gag on this one, Steve, because I'm not convinced that you understand what NASA said. According to the new analysis of satellite data, the Antarctic ice sheet showed a net gain of 112 billion tons of ice per year from 1992 to 2001. So where does the myth come from that the ice sheets are melting? The net gain, net gain being the key words, slowed down to only 82 billion tons of ice per year between 2003 and 2008. I like that you're hammering home the net gain, net gain, net gain, because you know there's still a little bit of loss in the Antarctic, but you're right, there is a net gain on the Antarctic. But you didn't mention that there's also a net loss for the entire planet. Greenland also has a major ice sheet. The total net ice loss for Greenland is an average of 269 billion tons of ice every year. Subtract that from Antarctica's gain of what is now an average of 82 billion tons of ice, the planet suffers a net loss of 147 billion tons of ice every year. Watch this. You See this? This is a glacier on Greenland being claimed by the sea. Now look how much ice is going in all at once. This isn't normal! Myth! You see, here on the Earth we have these things called seasons. Where in the Northern Hemisphere, sometimes it gets hotter and sometimes it's colder. When it's hotter, ice melts. Seriously, I could just leave the counterpoint at just that because obviously there is melting when it comes to summer and then there is refreezing when it comes to winter and in this particular clip showing all of this glacier being reclaimed by the sea how do we know that this isn't just over summer munch and is completely natural you've provided nothing to tell us why this isn't normal you've just said it and then moved on so fuck it i'll just say it is normal and move on the polar bears are dying off i'm sorry what truth there are possibly more of these soulless killing monsters on Earth today than ever, certainly since we've begun monitoring them. Possibly a low of around 12,000 in the 1960s with at least 25,000 on Earth today, likely much more. Are you joking? I can't tell if he's joking. He's going after the poster child for global warming? This is like trying to prove that a baseball team you hate isn't gonna make the playoffs because their mascot sucks. The objective data that shows warming and melting trends is not predicated on the population size of polar bears. Polar bears were used by activist organizations as an easy way to invoke empathy and show that global warming isn't a problem for the future, it's a problem right now. This was used to light a fire under our ass. If anything, this is really a testament to the resiliency and tenacity of the polar bears. Huge variables that experts could not have calculated for. Steve, this is how global warming is explained to children. And the fact that you'd even bring this up shows that you have a child's understanding of climate change. Actually, it shows that climate change is a scam. It shows that it's pushed purely based on emotional reasoning rather than any scientific data. Okay, so the armored skeptic is fine with lying to children for propaganda purposes. However, with what's happening with the melting of their ice due to climate change, the projections suggest that two-thirds of that population could disappear by the year 2050. As you know, polar bears are absolutely dependent upon sea ice. The National Wildlife Federation supports listing the species as a threatened species. This way, we can help ensure for the future, our children will have polar bears to see, just as I've been lucky to see them in my time here at the National Wildlife Federation. This guy is obviously lying towards adults, unless children can have children. So I guess the armored skeptic is cool with lying towards adults as well? The National Wildlife Federation supports the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's proposal of January 2007 to list the polar bear as a threatened species. Since that proposal was first put out, the evidence has become even more overwhelming than it originally was. The USGS, United States Geological Survey, in September 2007 released nine scientific studies and came to the conclusion that fully two-thirds of the polar bear population in the world is likely to be gone by the year 2050. Okay, so Armored Skeptic, are you cool with lying to Congress? Actually, maybe he is, because what do they have in Canada? The Queen? Like, can you lie to the Queen or will she behead you? Well, maybe their climate analysis was actually pretty accurate and it was just the resiliency of the polar bear that saved it. Well, no, we know for a fact, at the time, 
that their analysis was flawed. Uh, my name is Scott Armstrong. I'm a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. As stated, the primary problem we're looking at today is what might happen to polar bears in the future. We found that the Amstrup uh, report contravened 41 of the principles, the Hunter report contravened 61, and so on down the line. What's most important to look at is how many principles did they really follow? And it turns out that they properly applied in the case of Amstrup 17 and the case of Hunter 10. Now, on a percentage basis, that means they followed 12% of the relevant principles. Now, while the population of polar bears does not directly correlate to the particular temperature in the Arctic, Steven Crowder is simply pointing out that these global warming alarmists have lied in the past, have lied in the present, and will lie in the future. Change. Myth number four. Our current climate models are accurate, and our predictions have been stellar. Yes, the predictive model for climate change has not been accurate, which is a good thing. But this doesn't disprove climate change. Just because we know something is happening does not mean scientists automatically have to be able to predict how it's going to play out. That's not how science works. You've only proven that the current theoretical model is flawed. Climate change science is not climate change. Climate change is happening objectively outside of the science that studies it happening. I know that the future models are flawed because the data that they use to create these models is flawed as well. I'm going to play a little bit of an extended clip here, but it's all very relevant to this debate. And I want people to actually see this whole thing. I thank the chairman and the ranking members for the opportunity to offer testimony today. Prior to 2009, I felt that supporting the IPCC consensus on climate change was a responsible thing to do. I bought into the argument, don't trust what one scientist says, trust what an international team of a thousand scientists has said after years of careful deliberation. That all changed for me in November 2009, following the leaked ClimateGate emails that illustrated the sausage making and even bullying that went into building the consensus. I started speaking out, saying that scientists needed to do better at making the data and supporting information publicly available, being more transparent about how they reach conclusions doing a better job of assessing uncertainties, and actively engaging with scientists having minority perspectives. The response of my colleagues to this is summed up by the title of a 2010 article in the Scientific American. Climate heretic Judith Curry turns on her colleagues. I came to the growing realization that I had fallen into the trap of groupthink. I had accepted the consensus based on second-order evidence, the assertion that a consensus existed. I began making an independent assessment of topics in climate science that had the most relevance to policy. And what have I concluded from this assessment? Human-caused climate change is a theory in which the basic mechanism is well understood, but whose magnitude is highly uncertain. No one questions that surface temperatures have increased overall since 1880, or that humans are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, or that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases have a warming effect on the planet. However, there is considerable uncertainty and disagreement about the most consequential issues, whether the warming has been dominated by human causes versus natural variability, how much the planet will warm in the 21st century, and whether warming is dangerous. The central issue in the scientific debate on climate change is the extent to which the recent and future warming is caused by humans versus natural climate variability. Research effort and funding has focused on understanding human causes of climate change. However, we have been misled in our quest to understand climate change by not paying sufficient attention to natural causes of climate variability in particular from the sun and from the long-term oscillations in ocean circulations. Why do scientists disagree about climate change? The historical data is sparse and inadequate. There's disagreement about the value of different classes of evidence, notably the value of global climate models. There's disagreement about the appropriate logical framework for linking and assessing the evidence. 
and scientists disagree over assessments of areas of ambiguity and ignorance. How then and why have climate scientists come to a consensus about a very complex scientific problem that the scientists themselves acknowledge has substantial and fundamental uncertainties? Climate scientists have become entangled in an acrimonious political debate that has polarized the scientific community. As a result of my analyses that challenge IPCC conclusions, I have been called a denier by other climate scientists and most recently by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. My motives have been questioned by Representative Grijalva in a recent letter sent to the president of Georgia Tech. There is enormous pressure for climate scientists to conform to the so-called consensus. This pressure comes not only from politicians, but from federal funding agencies, universities and professional societies, and scientists themselves who are green activists. Reinforcing this consensus are strong monetary, reputational, and authority interests. In this politicized environment, advocating for carbon dioxide emissions reductions is becoming the default expected position for climate scientists. This advocacy extends to the professional society that publish journals and organize conference. Policy advocacy, when combined with understating the uncertainties, risks destroying science's reputation for honesty and objectivity, without which scientists become regarded as merely another lobbyist group. I'm talking about fucking politics. And I fucking hate politics. I believe that I got into politics a little bit because of the election, and I think everybody was. Everybody was getting their two cents in. I think that just the momentum of all the political change that happened after the election and because of the election, I just, the momentum kept me going, and, and I, st I started realizing I'm talking about things that I don't know much about and things I don't have a lot of passion for. And honestly, the only way for me to do that is to stick with my strengths. My strengths are entertaining, skepticism, atheism, film, and I also like cars, but that's beside the point. I'm in over my head, and I'm, I'm sorry that I let things get this far. I think season three for Armored Skeptic is going to be a big reset, going back to form, making it entertaining again, fun again, and about the debate. I miss the debate. Climate change is 90% politics and 10% science. Welcome to the debate.